Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a roundtable on international law and Asia looking to the future. This is also the launch of the CILE Academy. This event is scheduled to run for 90 minutes with a conversation amongst the panelists, followed by a Q&A. I'll now hand you over to our moderators who are also the co-directors of the E Academy, Dr. Nilifor Oral and Dr. Patricia galvao Tillis. Thank you very much, Zoe, for that introduction. Uh, as director of the Center for International Law, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this roundtable discussion inaugurating our new CRL E Academy uh, for International Law. The CRL was established in 2009 and with the mission to enable Singapore and the Asia Pacific region to play a more significant role in the promotion and development of international law. In this past decade, the center has covered a great amount of ground, and we now look forward to the next decade. Um, but how will the future look for international law? Our panel today includes uh, the leading names in international law in Singapore, and also, I must say, internationally. Um, and they will share with us some of their insights in, during this discussion, a roundtable format where we will be posing some questions. Well, the idea for the Center for International Law to host an Academy of International Law is not new. The pandemic provided an opportunity thanks to technology. But I must also thank my dear friend and colleague uh, from the International Law Commission, Professor, Professor Patricia Gavalotelis, who inspired this pilot project. So it's my pleasure now to hand over the screen to you, Patricia, uh, as, and you are also co-director with me uh, for the Academy and also co-moderator of this roundtable session. Thank you so much, Nilifer. Um, hello to all. Uh, I suppose it's good afternoon in Singapore, but in Lisbon, Portugal, where I'm uh, addressing you from, it's still early morning, uh, but it's really a, a pleasure for me and an honor to be part of this project of the CIL Academy um, and um, being today as a moderator for this launching uh, roundtable. Um, I have to say that um, um, this um, idea of having an e-academy um, is really a project that was born out of the lockdown period where we were all at home um, uh, thinking of uh, ways to continue uh, engaging with international law, uh, teaching, disseminating, and, and of course, um, many, um, you know, most <laughs> of uh, the pandemic has brought bad things, but at the same time, it has brought uh, new opportunities and thinking about a project that was conceived specifically for this period and with the constraints, but at the same time, the opportunities that we have now in the digital world uh, was the motivation um, of creating this e academy. And, and I'm very grateful um, to CIL and especially to Nilfer Oral for uh, the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, I am also extremely grateful for uh, all the support that we have received from CIL, uh, from the governing boards. Um, some of the members are here today uh, with us, but also uh, from a more practical aspect uh, from all the team. And I have to mention Jerry, who's really the person that makes everything happen. We have the ideas, but Jerry, she's the one who makes things happen. Uh, but I'm also, um, I want to uh, say a special word of thanks uh, to all of the lecturers um, that have accepted to be a part of this project. Um, you'll be able to see the list of lecturers um, uh, in uh, the brochure that is available on the website. Um, I think we have managed to, uh, and with a lot of generosity and enthusiasm, uh, we have managed uh, to put together a great team uh, of lecturers and guest speakers. 
I have to say that one of the guest speakers we invited, she was so enthusiastic. She wanted to be a participant in the academy. And for us, that was the best compliment. Uh, but I also um, have to uh, say a special word of thanks of the to the assistants uh, that are going to be assisting the lecturers um, and especially um, a, a very work, warm welcome um, to the participants in the, in the academy that will start the, their journey tomorrow. Um, uh, until December uh, for having the faith to take part in this pilot project. I'm very grateful and I am looking forward to this round table today uh, to mark the official launching of the Academy. And so back to you now, Nilfer. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, so uh, I'm now going to introduce our uh, opening speaker. The CIL is extremely fortunate to have as one of its founders and as the chair of its international advisory panel, Professor S. Jaya Kumar. Now, it's very challenging to write a short introduction of someone with such a colossal career in public service and diplomacy. And so I readily admit I cannot possibly do Professor Jaya Kumar justice in this. Most recently, his remarkable career and outstanding service to Singapore was recognized on Singapore's National Day with the Order of Temasek, with highest distinction awarded by the President. Professor Jaya Kumar has dedicated his life to public service and diplomacy. He has held many high-level government positions. He was a cabinet minister in Singapore for three decades. His portfolio includes foreign affairs minister, home affairs minister, minister of law and labor, and more. He was also coordinating minister for national security. He served as deputy prime minister and senior minister. And in 2011, he retired uh, from politics, but he hasn't retired really. Uh, he continues to be senior legal advisor uh, to the minister of foreign affairs. Um, his contributions to Singapore and, may I say, to international law and diplomacy are truly awe-inspiring and wonderfully recorded in a book very simply titled Diplomacy, from which I learned a great deal. We are so pleased to have Professor Jaya Kumar give the opening statement inaugurating this first session of the CIL Academy of International Law. Professor Jaya Kumar. Welcome to all the participants to the round table, as well as the participants to the E Academy, which is going to follow tomorrow. I think all of us know that COVID-19 has posed big challenges for organizations like the Center for International Law. But thanks to technology, Nilifer, Patricia, and the team have really been creative and innovative. And as a result, the Center for International Law has been able to organize a total of some eight e-events, e-conferences on various dimensions of public international law on COVID-19. And we saw some 3,000 participants from 68 countries. Of course, uh, not having a physical meeting of physical conferences during this time poses a very big disadvantage, particularly not being able to network and interact, which is the real benefit of many of these physical meetings. But there's always a silver lining because through these e-events, we get participants from far more countries than we've ever been able to get at physical meetings. For example, today's round table, we have some 336 participants, I believe from 55 countries. Every con continent in the world is represented from faraway countries like Azerbaijan, Ethiopia, Brazil, Romania, Iceland, Turkey. The physical meetings we have held in CIL in Singapore, it's impossible to get participations from so many countries because of the problems of physical distance and expenses. And for the E-Academy starting tomorrow, 
we have some 126 participants from 32 countries. So that leads me to suggest to Nilifer, and I've spoken to her, that I hope even if and when, quote unquote, normalcy returns, and we are able to have physical meetings, I hope that CIL periodically can still have e-events so as to be able to continue to have this wide participation and the wide reach that we see today. Now, a few words about the e-academy of international law. I believe this is the first of its kind in Asia, and for that, we must really give credit to CIL, Nilufer, and Patricia Tellis, and for the team for organizing this landmark event. It consists of 15 weeks of online advanced training in international law and practice. And the participants are really a diverse group of students, academics, diplomats, and lawyers. Uh, and they're going to be dealing with important topics of international law. And we have an equally rich diversity of the trainers and the lecturers are distinguished serving judges or former judges of international tribunals like ITLOS, the ICJ, organizations like the ILC, as well as practitioners of international law. I think it's a unique opportunity for the participants to learn from some of the top practitioners of international law in the world. What about the future? Similar to what I said about the round table just now, I hope that in next year, if we are allowed to have physical meetings, that the center will organize an academy of international law of a physical nature in Singapore and continue this tradition. But even if we cannot have a physical meeting, I hope that an e-event of a second round, a uh, second Academy of International Law will be held. Of course, very much will depend on the feedback and the support of the participants at this first inaugural e-academy. And based on their suggestions, and their feedback, I'm sure Nilifer and the team, Patricia and the team, will be able to organize an even better uh, academy next year. So I'll hand over back to you, Nilifer and Patricia. Thank you so much for your strong support and words, and we certainly do look forward to making this a tradition of the CIL. There certainly is a great need, which has become quite evident in the interest that we have received. Um, so I now will turn over to my dear colleague, Patricia, uh, to start um, the round of questions uh, for our round table. And again, this is a round table discussion. It's not a series of presentations. We will ask each um, of the panelists or give them an opportunity to answer four questions. And, and then we certainly will entertain questions from uh, the participants afterwards. Patricia, you, you go first. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Nilofer. And again, thank you very much, Professor Jaya, for your kind words and your encouragement uh, regarding this project. Um, so starting the, the round table, we're extremely fortunate uh, to have today, not only Professor Jaya Kumar, but also um, um, Professor Tommy Cole, who is ambassador at large um, uh, for Singapore, for, and also chairman um, of the CIL governing board. And we also have um, Professor Ch Simon Chesterman, who's the Dean of the Law Faculty of NUS. Uh, and also um, uh, we have uh, together 
um, with us, um, Daphne Hong, who is the Director General uh, for International Affairs uh, Division of the Attorney General's Chamber, and Lionel Yi, uh, who is the Deputy Attorney General. So we have um, uh, an excellent round um, of guests to help us discuss uh, the topic that we have chosen as um, uh, the launching for the launching event, which is uh, international law and Asia looking to the future. And as Nilofer mentioned, we have selected uh, four questions and we'll see if we ma can manage to get to all of them because they're all, all inter equally interesting, but ranging from the impact of COVID-19 on international law and institutions, to the grow, growing rivalry uh, between the US and China and its impact in international law um, and questions such as the impact of climate change and technological developments on international law. Uh, but also a final question on how small countries like Singapore uh, can uh, or should navigate this new normal. So the, these are the four broad topics that we have for our discussion and we'll try to go one by one, although of course some of them are interconnected and uh, uh, we may be um, uh, mixing them a little bit. So let me start with, uh, with Lionel um, on the question of the impact of COVID-19 and, and international law and institutions. Um, it, it's the question that uh, everybody is discussing now and asking now, um, and we wanted to hear your, your input, your views, um, on what you think um, in terms of the near future, the present and the near future, what would be the impact of COVID-19 on international law and institutions? Please, Lionel, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Patricia. Um, and let me begin by uh, thanking both you and Nilofa and the team for putting the E-Academy together and organizing this uh, round table. And I also want to join in the welcome that is extended to all the participants and, and all those who will be trainers. I hope you really have a, a very, very good uh, program in the coming weeks and, and, and months. Um, turning, Patricia, to your question, I think it's, uh, it, it seems to be asking things in two parts. First, the impact of the pandemic on international law and then on institutions. And what I propose to do is also address the two uh, separately. As far as the impact on international law is concerned, uh, for me, I think there are probably three things that uh, stand out. First, I think the crisis has uh, stress tested, as with most crises, various uh, systems, and that includes uh, some of the normative regimes that we have in international law. And in that stress test, it's clearly shown up certain gaps that I, at some point need to be addressed. So, for example, uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, in March and April, you saw a sort of every state for itself type of uh, situation where many states uh, scrambled to impose uh, export restrictions on all kinds of products, uh, face masks, PPEs, even food like uh, wheat and, and, and rice. And I think that brought home uh, to many the, their, their own vulnerabilities with respect to their own uh, supply chains. And while the situation itself um, was unsatisfactory to many, the reality is that export prohibitions are in fact allowed under the WTO GATT agreement for critical shortages of uh, food and essential products. I think the challenge really is that when that particular provision of the GATT was drafted, that was, I believe, 1947, where we were in a completely different world. One where shortages may have been localized or perhaps on a regional basis, but not quite. Uh, one where it is so interdependent and where the shortages are caused by a worldwide phenomenon. And that's led to various interested states coming together to issue uh, a, a range of uh, statements at the ministerial level. ASEAN, APEC, even bilaterally, uh, I can think of the, the, the statement that was issued between the governments of Singapore and New Zealand, for example. And I think in the longer run, what will happen is that some of these statements will evolve from what are essentially political statements now 
into more binding commitments at the multilateral, but maybe not even at the multilateral level, at the, at, at the bilateral or regional level. For example, they may be incorporated into some of the existing regional trade agreements. So that's the first point on law. The second highlight for me is, I think as far as human rights is concerned, what I hope to see coming out of the pandemic is a much more holistic uh, focus on economic and social rights, as well as uh, civil and political rights. I mean, traditionally, I think economic and social rights have largely been treated as a, a sort of a poor cousin of their civil and political uh, counterparts. But what the pandemic has, I think, brought into quite sharp focus is first the interplay between the two sets of rights. For example, the right of freedom on the one hand against the right to health on the other. But it's also, I think, brought into sharp focus the importance of some of these economic and social rights in and of themselves. So it's not just the right to health, whether it takes the form of uh, health care uh, um, or vaccines or medicines, but also, I think, the right to work as the economic impact of the pandemic gradually uh, unfolds. Uh, and also things like the right to education when schools are closed or when education takes place in an online environment and you're concerned with uh, the, the, the level of access to education. So that's the second point. Um, my third point is, I think coming out of this pandemic, a lot of the legal norms which emerge will be or will have to be underpinned by trust. For example, if you, if, if you establish travel bubbles or green lanes, uh, that, that writes on the level of comfort and confidence you have in your partner country uh, in getting its house in order, whether it's in terms of um, managing infection well, uh, reliably reporting on, on infections, or reliably administering swap tests, and so on. And then similarly, if you are going to go into commitments to keep supply chains open, there has to be a certain level of trust that when the button is actually pressed, um, the other side is going to hold to uh, it, it, what it has committed to. And, and that trust in turn, I think, is linked to credibility. Credibility both in terms of uh, governance, but also credibility in uh, um, the, the, the partner countries taking international obligations and, and, and commitments uh, seriously. So that's on the law side of the house. Then if I turn to um, its impact on institutions, I, I think what stands out most for me is uh, the extent to which remote communications technology has been used to an unprecedented scale over the past few months and in, 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 in the coming months. And that includes the use of such technology by international law bodies. And some of this is probably going to stay beyond the, 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 the pandemic when we return to what uh, Prof Jayakumar referred to as uh, normalcy. So if I start with uh, um, the international law making side of the house, we are already seeing uh, bodies like UNCITRAL using hybrid arrangements where working group meetings uh, are conducted uh, with some participants physically present and others um, dialing in remotely. And I accept, I think, the, 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 that there are detractors who say that um, in a negotiation setting, you, you, you need that human-to-human -human interaction. You need that relationship uh, building. But there's probably some room for quite serious discussions with the experience that we're going to gain in the past couple of months, in the coming months, on how we can use some of this technology at least to improve the efficiency of the negotiation process. I'll give you two examples. One, does everyone actually need to send you know, delegations of a particular size in future. If delegates who have much more limited roles and perhaps even limited speaking roles uh, can participate remotely. 
Secondly, um, when in, in a lot of these lawmaking conferences, you, you realize that quite a lot of conference time is taken up by delegations who are reading off prepared scripts. And you, 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 you wonder whether there is some scope again for this to be done remotely, maybe a few a week or so in advance of the actual physical meeting itself. So that by doing so, you actually end up freeing a bit more time, a, a bit more of that, of, of that precious allotted conference time for the kind of things you need to do that require the, those face-to-face -face interactions. I mean, I flag these as examples, as ideas. I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I, I feel that these are things which I think we may need to reflect upon. And then if I turn around to international legal adjudication, likewise, the, the, the international law institutions have already been, been, been quite active on this front. The International Court of Justice uh, amended its rules uh, a couple of months ago to allow hearings by video link. And it heard one case between Guyana and Venezuela at the end of June. And just last week, and I believe the, the, the hearing ends today, uh, uh, they've been hearing preliminary objections in the case between Qatar and the United Arab Emirates on viola alleged violations on the, of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And it's quite interesting because it's actually a bit of a hybrid type of hearing where you have nine of the judges of the ICJ sitting in the Great Hall of Justice and the remaining judges uh, um, dialing in remotely and the national delegations are doing their oral pleadings remotely as well. And I know that uh, it lost is going to do likewise in the middle of next month in, uh, in its uh, special chamber proceeding uh, on a, man, uh, a boundary delimitation case brought uh, between Mauritius and the Maldives. Um, again, I, I, I do hear the detractors uh, they ex uh, and accept that remote proceedings can make it difficult to do certain things reading the judges, watching out for non-verbal cues is a little bit more challenging. But perhaps again, in, in the longer run, some of this can be done for administrative meetings, some interlocutory hearings like preliminary objections. Uh, some things I think maybe we can address via technical solutions. So at last week's hearing, I, 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 I was observing and, and, and wondering if council could actually see individual members of the court in the ICJ up close. Right. On my part, I could only see, I think, uh, what, just one monitor of the, of the Great Hall of Justice with all nine judges there. But these are, I think, things which can be resolved through technical solutions. And while I acknowledge, I think that um, it, it does pose certain challenges to, to advocacy, uh, maybe there are some things which we can learn and adapt from our colleagues from the international arbitration circuit where remote hearings have, are far more common and in fact at the moment they are the norm even for things like cross-examination of uh, witnesses and where I, what's striking to me is look, the, 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 the community of practitioners there seems to be a lot more sanguine about the use of remote technology so th those are a couple of my reflections and I'll stop there thank you Patricia Thank you very much. I don't know if um, any of the other panelists, I see Simon raising his hand. Simon, you have a floor, please. Sure, um, very briefly, and, and I agree as usual with almost everything Lionel said, but I wanted to add maybe a slightly more provocative push on some of the gaps that maybe he's being too diplomatic to highlight because, uh, and I'll say two bad things and one, th one good thing revealed by uh, COVID-19, at least in my estimation, focusing on institutions. Um, and the first gap is the, the inability of our existing international institutions to deal with the problem. The World Health Organization has been revealed as weak, uh, but it was designed as a weak institution. Uh, it's become a kind of whipping boy. Now it's involved in this investigation into the origins of the virus. Uh, but the World Health Organization clearly 
uh, was not given the powers, was not able, uh, and then demonstrably was incapable of taking a leadership role. Uh, another institution that was really left wanting was the UN Security Council. Uh, for three months, uh, the UN Security Council had a draft resolution calling for weekly, calling for a ceasefire in the pandemic, and it was held up basically by US-China rivalries, something we'll come back to. So that's one, one big gap. Um, a second gap is a vacuum of leadership at the international level, because if this had happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you would have had the United States uh, as a leader. Uh, and really the, the extent to which US authority has been diminished over the past several years has been extraordinary. Uh, and the fact that uh, the US is suffering so terribly from the pandemic is one example, but that it would take this opportunity to withdraw from the World Health Organization is just an extraordinary um, uh, indication of how much the US has diminished in its role as a leader uh, in, in the global order. And I say that as someone who has, is a huge believer in the good that the US has done for the world. Um, so those are two bad things, I think. One, one good thing um, is that, and this is another topic we'll touch on later, climate change, the pandemic has at least shown that we can change our behaviour, that when we are motivated to, uh, when the science is there, the vast majority of the world can pull together and change its behaviour uh, in a way that can at least put the brakes on uh, a global ill that is affecting all of us. Uh, and so even as uh, many of these gaps, many of these limitations have suggested a fragmentation of existing structures, uh, there is yet hope that we can, when it's necessary, all pull together in the same direction. Uh, and uh, there's some indication that this means that when there are future global challenges, it might be possible similarly to get people to work together and to get states to work together. Thank you so much, Simon. I think uh, what you've just said uh, is uh, slowly bringing us also to question two. Um, so I'm not sure if Daphne or, or, or Tommy want to comment or we, we I would uh, give the floor now to Nulofer uh, to move us to the question of the growing rivalry between uh, the US and, and China, which is uh, also was alluded already. Yes. Daphne, Daphne, go ahead. Um, I just want to um, add to Linus' point um, about um, the, 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 the gaps. Um, but we can also see many countries adopting measures to respond to, to this um, dire situation. So yes, um, they, they, they have introduced emergency measures like um, export restrictions. But as Liner alluded, um, these are allowed by the trade, the WTO uh, trade rules, but subject to restrictions. Um, I think it would also, since we are talking about the future, be interesting to watch um, to what extent these challenges are maintained even post COVID, and also um, whether there would be increased legal challenges to such measures. Um, whether during the COVID period or post the COVID period, um, it is um, something which the, the international law community um, should keep a, 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 a watch out for. Uh, all right, I think we can now move on to the second question. I think the first question has already uh, raised uh, a lot of food for thought and discussions, and I can see that this uh, session could go on for a very long time, actually. <laughs> um, but it does lead into the second, because the second question is about um, what has become a very dominant feature of our lives, this rivalry, the growing rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, and its impact um, on international law right now and also in the future. And of course, it does also tie in with the pandemic. So if I could start um, with um, Tommy Cole on this, uh, if you could um, give us uh, your thoughts. Um, th thank you, Nilufa. 
Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to begin by saying that for a period of 50 years, from about 1950 to 1991, the world experienced a confrontation between two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and it, the world was divided into two rival camps, a pro-American camp and a pro-Soviet camp. There were dangerous moments when these two great powers almost came to blows, especially during the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis. But although the two great powers did not fight a nuclear war, they supported many proxy wars all over the world. So when the Cold War ended in 1991, I had hoped that we will never experience another confrontation between two great powers. I'm sorry to say that we are experiencing once again a confrontation between an incumbent superpower, the United States, and a rising challenger, China. And this confrontation began as a trade dispute, but is now expanded into many fields, into technology, into cybersecurity, into law. And I want to talk about the impact of this rivalry on international law. And I want to refer specifically to the South China Sea. We are beginning to see in the South China Sea that both the United States and China have weaponized international law. They are using international law as an instrument of warfare. And some of my friends have invented a term and call it lawfare. So, Recently, the United States has said that China's claims are illegal. China should comply with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. China should comply with the award of the Arbitral Tribunal of July 2016. The Chinese side, of course, takes the opposite view that China's claims are in conformity with international law and it has legitimate reason not to recognize the Arbitral Award. The interesting thing is that we are also seeing lawfare, not just between China and the United States, but also between China and four ASEAN countries, namely Vietnam, Malaysia, and Philippines, which have overlapping claims to China, but also between China and Indonesia over the issue of so-called historic fishing rights in the economic zone of Natuna's Island. So, one of the features of, the, of our contemporary world is that international law <clears throat> is being contested between the two great powers, but also between one of them and, and his neighboring countries. Um, I, I will conclude then, invite uh, questions and comments. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, coming from yourself, uh, um, Professor and Ambassador Ko, uh, your role as the president of the Law of the Sea Conference and the hopes that uh, the Law of the Sea would actually be for bringing peace and security. I think the points you've raised about lawfare are very interesting. And I would open um, to our panelists, perhaps Simon, I um, would, would like to follow up on, on, on this question. Sure. Um, and, and again, I, I uh, agree with what Tommy has said, and he's got a, a longer perspective and a deeper perspective than many of us on this. I'd, I'd add three points, two on the kind of international relations aspect, and then third, specifically on the law. Um, briefly on the IR side, um, the first thing to say about this rivalry is that in many ways it's overdue. Um, the US and China have been building towards some kind of confrontation uh, for many years. And indeed, those of us who remember the early George W. Bush administration, uh, when he got elected in 2000, the early months of 2001, uh, there was a shift in the US language from strategic partnership under uh, 
Clinton to a strategic competitor under the United States. We had the EP3 spy plane incident that got uh, also related to the South China Sea, a US military uh, surveillance um, aircraft crashed well, crashed into a Chinese plane uh, and had to land on Hainan Island. Uh, and there was the beginning of a language of containment in US international relations circles. Uh, and then of course, September 11 happened in 2001 and China was off the radar completely, uh, at least for the US uh, until very recently. Uh, and that was exactly in line with Chinese foreign policy. This was Deng Xiaoping's policy of Taguang Yanghui, which basically means um, nourish obscurity, keep your head down, uh, develop your economy. Uh, and so the possibility of containing China back in 2000, 2001 was set aside. Uh, and now it's not possible to contain China, at least not in any meaningful way. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is um, China is very unusual in that it's, it's really a resurgent power. And we've never had a situation at least that I know of in global history, where a power has become a world power twice. Uh, so China was a regional, or in many ways, a global power um, around 400 years ago. Uh, and so it's very unusual to have that situation of a rising power. So that, that's really context. But thirdly, to focus on international law, it is striking, as, as Tommy said, uh, that the South China Sea is being weaponized by both the US and China. The law is being weaponized. At the same time, although most lawyers uh, myself included, think that China has a difficult legal case to argue uh, in the way that it's trying to articulate its position. At least China has signed the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, and despite all its protestations, has not repudiated that convention because it sees the benefits of being part of that treaty regime uh, in a way that the US has been unable to sign the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this in many ways speaks to the, the oddity of China's role as a, as a rising or re-rising world power, um, that it seems not to be going down the path of former rising powers that have really remade the world in their image, the way the colonial powers did, the way the US did at the end of World War II with the extent to which the US played a role in crafting the instru institutions of world order. Uh, China seems very much an evolutionary rather than revolutionary power. Uh, and that far from wanting to overturn the Westphalian system of states in favor of some kind of Eastphalian system that occasionally is suggested, China is in many ways a very conservative power. And if it's articulating a vision of human rights and democracy and sovereignty, uh, in many ways it goes back to the point that Lionel made with regard to COVID-19, that this is not throwing out human rights, throwing out sovereignty, but rather retreating to a slightly more defensive notion of sovereignty um, a, a position that would prioritize economic, social, cultural rights, uh, at least with regard to human rights. Uh, and so there is change afoot, but it is, uh, is incremental rather than, as I said, revolutionary, it seems. But like all of us, I'm, I'm looking forward to good questions. And I see a few yeah. questions coming yeah. up in the chat. Look forward to them later. Yeah, no, this is wonderful. This is great. And, and I'm tempted to jump in, but I'm going to let Lionel <laughs> make some comments. Yes, uh, th thank you. And um, I, 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 I do share and agree with uh, many of the observations that uh, have been made. But I thought I wanted to add a bit of a perspective as well, just, just in case people go away thinking that there's sort of like rivalry everywhere and, and uh, essentially stymieing uh, uh, international law uh, as a whole. Um, Prof Ko started his... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it remarks by recalling the rivalry between the United States and the USSR uh, during the Cold War. But even in those uh, contexts, we have seen that uh, international law instruments did come into being in spite of that. So you've got the Vienna Convention, the Law of Treaties, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, uh, UNCLOS, I mean, these were all essentially, and even if the United States did not, uh, uh, has not become a party to it, th these were all, uh, in a way, the products of, a, of, of the Cold War era. So I, I think we need to have a bit of context in, in, in the sense that we wasn't see it as sort of uh, uh, stultifying international law on, 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 on all fronts. Uh, and even in mo much more recent times, in spite of the uh, US and China rivalry we talk about, just last year, we had both China and the United States coming to Singapore to sign the Singapore Convention on Mediation. 
uh, I have been involved uh, over the past about two years or so in negotiations in the United Nations on an instrument on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, both China and the United States are active participants. And I have to say that from my perspective, I've seen fairly little of that rivalry um, uh, uh, um, manifesting itself. So in a way, I think when we look at this issue, it's also partly dependent on context and dependent on the specific uh, interests that are, that, that, that are at stake. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I think that con that comparison is, is really interesting between um, USSR and the US and now China and the US. Very different presidents, of course. Yeah. Um, anyone from the round table who would like to comment? Um, we could go on again on each of these topics. I realize I'm holding myself back as well. If not, then perhaps we can go to question three. Uh, and I will then pass it on to my co-moderator, Patricia. Thank you, Nila, for you're right in saying that we could go on with these questions over and over for a long time because they're really uh, interesting, but I'm sure we'll have um, the opportunity uh, in the Q&A session to come back to some of these aspects and have some additional views from the panelists. Um, so moving to the next question, which is the question of the impact of um, climate change and technological developments on international law. Um, it, it's interesting uh, what um, uh, Simon had uh, said previously about how um, this moment, this current moment um, in history with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has also some positive in effects in the sense that it can show that uh, um, uh, things can be changed, things can be done, um, science matters, uh, listening to science matters. And so um, I wonder if there's an opportunity also at this moment um, to have uh, more political will uh, to deal seriously with the question of um, uh, climate change in particular. So I wanted to ask Daphne and um, her views and on, on uh, the impacts of climate change and technological developments on international law. Um, so Daphne, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, um, I am hopeful that when it comes to um, the questions of climate change and technological development um, or rather technological advancement that um, there is more cause for optimism, hopefully. Um, on the question of um, the impact of climate change on international law, we can see that um, the work on, uh, insofar as climate change is concerned, is largely on the UNFCC uh, COP front. Um, in particular, in its efforts to implement the Paris um, Agreement. Under this agreement, states have autonomy in setting their own emission targets or what um, uh, is called, what is referred to as the nationally determined contributions. States are held to these commitments via accountability frameworks and transparency mechanisms. But unlike in, say, other areas of international law, say, um, international law of the sea or, or uh, world trade law, um, the compliance mechanism that's established under the Paris Agreement, the, the intention underlying that is to implement these NDCs and promote compliance in a manner that is, um, quote, transparent, non adversarial and non-punitive. So we can see that this presents a very unique um, and perhaps even a sweet generous model for ground up development of international norms. Apart from the UNFCC platform, we also see that there are efforts to harmonize concerns um, uh, harmonize regulations on climate change concerns on other UN platforms um, like ICAO and IMO 
um, for, for example, what Lina has just alluded to um, uh, on the BBNJ platform, there have been efforts to take into account climate change in, um, for example, in, in um, uh, environmental impact um, assessment, uh, the requirements for that. Um, and of course, uh, we have Nilufa as well as Patricia uh, themselves working on ILC, um, on the impact of sea level rise on baselines uh, and maritime boundaries, and, and also um, other humanitarian uh, issues like migration. We also see countries banding together to form carbon market clubs. And um, internally, uh, at least within, the, uh, within Singapore, we are also keeping a very close uh, and interested, interested watch on the emergence of uh, climate litigation in certain um, countries on the domestic front. So what we can see across these various work streams, um, what, what we can discern is climate change international lawmaking is uh, multi-dimensional and cross-cutting. It does not just deal with um, legal, but we also have to factor in scientific, economic, um, and, and, and economic disciplines. But what this means is that um, there is a lot of room for innovation with lawyers collaborating with experts in, in, in other fields to come up with a, 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 a system um, for the future that, that works. So moving on um, to technology, um, Lionel has, has talked about um, the innovative use of technology when it comes to um, coming up with new ways of performing traditional activities. He talked about um, using technology to, to um, enhance international negotiation. Um, to ensure that there will still be access to justice um, even during the COVID period. But we can also see um, technological advancement generating new sectors of uh, economic activities, thereby um, leading to um, uh, what, what in Singapore we, we already can see, um, innovation in international trade law. And by this, I'm referring to um, the e-commerce negotiations on the WTO platform, uh, which we should keep a watch um, for. Singapore, on its part, has also been negotiating and concluding what we call digital economy agreements with like-minded uh, partner countries. So this, these negotiations seek to establish um, digital trade rules and digital economy col collaboration. In, in, in short, um, it is an attempt to modernize um, traditional trade rules to allow and to facilitate um, e-commerce and um, trading in, in a digital era. So some of the issues addressed include um, transparency, facilitative rules to promote cross-border e-payments. E um, and due to the limitation in time, let, let me not cover um, um, the other aspects. Um, but the other major impact um, of, of um, technological advancement on international law, we can see is on the question of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, in particular, um, technological advancement does raise issues of how traditional legal concepts and norms apply in cyberspace. So again, we can see that um, these issues are very much taken up on the UN platform, um, primarily under the UN GGE, um, or is a group of uh, governmental experts who have gotten together to try to um, uh, suggest a, a set of um, principles and, and, and guidelines on cybersecurity issues. Um, we also see the, the event of another group on the UN platform 
um, uh, known as the OEWG, uh, which is a working group that invites and, and allows all interested UN member states to come together to, to discuss um, how to regulate uh, cyber security, um, how to regulate uh, activities in the cyberspace in order to deal with um, cyber security concerns. Beyond UN, we can also see international organizations like ICAO um, and also IMO taking the lead to um, commence work in looking into rules and norms for, say, the regulation of um, autonomous um, aircrafts or autonomous vessels. Um, in short, when it comes to te technological advancement, um, it would appear that um, international law has not quite caught up with times um, or caught up with the, the speed of technological evolution, but um, that we can already see that um, there is concern on this and at least on the United Nations platform, we can see a lot of efforts um, that have commenced to look into harmonizing the, the, the rules, in particular when it comes to transnational um, issues for, for cybersecurity. So, so I am hopeful that um, unlike uh, when we are talking about um, um, the US-China, uh, uh, for want of a better word, uh, rivalry, um, when it comes to climate change, um, even though it is um, an effort that seeks to be ground up uh, with each country um, looking into a set of principles that would also work in their specific circumstances, I am hopeful that um, um, these two areas, climate change and technological advancement, would provide um, a platform for countries to collaborate, uh, at least when it comes to international law rulemaking. Thank you so much, Daphne, for identifying the specific areas where I think we, 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 most of us will agree that they are important areas to move forward, and I'll come back to uh, that later on. But maybe now it's time for Nilofer to move us on to the last question, because it's also important to discuss um, how um, uh, countries in Asia, and especially in Singapore, can navigate this new normal. So, Nilofer, uh, back to you. Yeah, thank you. And again, um, a lot of information and food for thought. Um, and I think this last question is particularly uh, relevant. One, of course, Singapore may be a small country, but I think we've all witnessed that it has a very very powerful punch in international law and diplomacy, and, and many countries look to it. And I learned also a lot from um, Professor Jaya Kumar's book uh, on, on Singapore and the role of small countries. Um, so the new normal, I think we're gonna have a lot of new normals following the pandemic and, and our discussion on US and China relations. Um, and in this case, I would like to ask Professor Jaya, how small countries like Singapore can or should navigate the quote unquote new normal? Thank you, Nilifa. Let me just make some broad observations based largely on my experience when I was a foreign minister. I think even in the best of times, small countries have a tough time to be relevant on the international stage. And that's because the reality is that bigger countries, the bigger you are, the more clout that you have. Uh, that's, that is a fact of life. But it does not mean that small countries are forever doomed to irrelevance. And as you have said, there are many examples where small countries through creative and skillful diplomacy have played a role, sometimes behind the scenes, uh, in helping in international forums or in other settings. 
uh, let me give an example of Lionel Yee himself, where even today, people in international law circles talk about his role in helping to bring about the successful conclusion of the statute on the ICC. So these are examples, but the extent to which small countries can play a role in international relations and international organizations depends on a benign normal state of affairs where there's no acrimony between the bigger powers. So this new Cold War, which Tommy has uh, rightfully pointed out, uh, poses a big dilemma for smaller and medium-sized countries because there are already signs that they are going to be pressured and cajoled into taking sides. Uh, this is a dilemma because in today's world, all countries have very complex relations with the United States and China, especially economic relations, trade, investments, and so on. So a small country cannot simply disengage and tell one that, look, goodbye, we are with the other fellow. So I'm not sure how things will pan out, but I do hope that the US and China realize that small and medium-sized countries have to act in accordance with their own national interests. And they do not press and pressure the smaller countries to take sides. And if the Cold War, the new Cold War is going to be long and protracted, if the dynamics between these two powers is going to be worsened, we may even see natural reactions from these smaller and medium-sized countries. They may seek comfort in their regional groupings like African Union, ASEAN, GCCs. Uh, and I would venture to say that maybe a natural reaction by these countries is to form new informal regional groups or bodies and maybe even a new non-aligned movement if things get worse. And that would be a natural reaction. So I do think that the big powers have to consider the position of the smaller and medium-sized countries. Now, you see in situations like in South China Sea, which uh, Prof. Tomiko mentioned, where some of the countries have differences of opinion with uh, China, I do not think that that is an example of siding with one or the other, but rather these countries in taking issue with China are actually acting out of their own national interests and their perceptions of how the law is on their side. So I'll just make those remarks as an opener. Thank you. Yes, thank you for those comments. And I think um, it does um, open up for, I hope, additional views from our panelists um, on how small countries can move forward now. And I guess what we're calling the new Cold War um, but of course, very different circumstances um, than existed in the 50s and thereafter. So could I call on who would like to um, make additional comments on this? Simon? Sure. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I, I would, however, push back a bit on the Cold War language. And I think Tommy earlier was drawing a comparison, but not saying we're kind of in a path deterministic way heading in that direction. Uh, among the differences are the number of countries, as Prof Jaya has just said, including smaller countries like Singapore, medium-sized countries like Australia and others, who have very, very strong economic ties with China and strong cultural, political, to some extent, military security ties with the United States and really don't want to be forced to choose between those two. Um, but more importantly, um, 
two, two arguments militate against a real Cold War division. One is uh, the integration of global supply chains, uh, which is something we've already touched on, uh, and that it would be, uh, it's hard to see how it would be in the self-interest of either China or the United States to escalate this conflict or to really divide up the world. Um, and the second thing is the lack of an ideological split. Uh, if anything, it's extraordinary how much the People's Republic of China, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, was the advocate of globalization at Davos a couple of years back. Uh, and it's the United States that's been embracing protectionist uh, economic policy. So I don't, I don't think we're heading towards an ideological split like that. But interestingly, going back to Daphne's point, it is in the area of technology, we are seeing the potential for a division of the internet. Uh, and that really goes back to a traditional notion of sovereignty that China is embracing uh, and the, the desire for data localization rules, the desire for um, control over resources is leading China to um, articulate a fairly strong notion of sovereignty that could potentially uh, slow or halt the, um, the technological, the information age uh, in intersections inter we've had. And on the flip side, we've seen the push against Huawei. Uh, the US-led initiative to try and stop Huawei uh, spreading its technology around the world if that's going to provide China with an advantage. So all this to say, I think there's certainly rivalry, I think there's certainly division, but I wouldn't put it quite in the language of Cold War metaphors, at least not, not yet. Thank you. And before we wrap up this, yes, I thought Tommy might uh, uh, have to, like to have the final word on, on these series of questions. Go ahead. It, it's just a very quick response to Simon. Um, Simon said Australia has strong economic interests in China and security and cultural interests in the United States and that Australia doesn't want to take sides. <clears throat> I, I, don't think, I don't think that's a perception of China. No? I think per, China perceives the current government of Australia as having decided to be on the United States side against China. So just a quick response to, to, to Simon. Simon also say in the current dispute between the United States and China, we don't have an ideological uh, element. It's, it's not true. Vice President Mike Pence, for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, keep demonizing the Chinese Communist Party. So, so there are leaders on the American side who want this contest to be also an ideological contest between communism on the one side and capitalism and, and democracy on the other side. So there is, I think, an ideological element here. <clears throat> Maybe just to clarify the distinction, uh, and I don't disagree that both the current administration in Australia and the current, in Canberra at least, and the current administration in the United States do adopt these positions. But I think you would agree that that's not a national position. And indeed, Joe Biden is campaigning precisely against the kind of division that, uh, that, uh, that Trump and uh, Pence and Pompeo have been advocating. So it's, we're not yet at the point where this, uh, to, certainly to the extent that during the Cold War, the ideological uh, division ran through the administration uh, and regardless of who was in charge, the ideological commitment was, was pretty clear. Uh, and we're far from that point, uh, at least uh, with regard to US-China and Australia-China rivalries. I think a, a, another quick response to Simon I think the current administration's antipathy to China has become a bipartisan policy. Even if there's a change of president in November, the US policy to China has changed. The US-China policy used to be one of engagement, cooperation, cooperation and competition. Now, the policy of the United States to China is one of competition and confrontation. And if you look at the opinion polls in America, the great majority of the American people no longer have positive feelings for China. And both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party 
have changed their stance, the fundamental stance to a China from a positive one, emphasizing cooperation, engagement, to a negative one, emphasizing containment and, and confrontation. <clears throat> Well, I, I, I think you might want to respond and this could go on. Um, one last word, and then I think we have quite a few questions. And yeah. uh, thank, thanks, Milton. And I'm looking forward to getting into the questions. And just to, to respond, I, I, I'm very wary of drawing large conclusions from political campaigns where Biden clearly is concerned about being painted as pro-China. But if we go back to US foreign policy as, as recently as four years ago, I know it seems like a lifetime ago, um, but the end of the Obama administration was very much uh, their policy was to engage with China. Uh, and I'm cautiously optimistic that cooler heads will prevail, but maybe this is a topic we'll have to revisit next year when there may well be a different administration in uh, Washington, DC. Indeed. Uh, in fact, we have 60 days to see uh, the future. Uh, be, uh, and there's no doubt, I think, that the, if there is a change of administration, that will have a important impact. But how much time will show? And again, this question, where does that place countries like Singapore, smaller countries, uh, tremendous pressure on them. Uh, so I think this is perhaps a topic we should follow up on and, and, and discuss further in another session. But in the meantime, uh, dear Patricia, why don't you take the first uh, uh, round of questions from our participants. I'm happy to see we have quite a few and good questions. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to all the panelists for this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I fully agree that perhaps uh, this last point of uh, uh, discussion would merit um, another discussion in, in um, uh, a short time um, after the US election. I think it would be very interesting to take stock and see um, what happens um, in the future, although none of us has a crystal ball. Um, and, and talking about crystal ball, I think one of the interesting um, questions that uh, came in our Q&A um, uh, chat forum um, is one that I think has also a, a close relationship between the different approaches of uh, uh, US and, and uh, China towards the pandemic and towards the role um, of uh, WHO um, and the question in the chat um, um, is it's directed to Simon, but I'm sure it can be also addressed by the other panelists that has to do with the reform of WHO. I mean, what could be done um, to strengthen uh, the, the, the organization to help it uh, uh, deal better with um, still the current pandemic and possibly future pandemics. And I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a crucial question, not only because it also touches upon this rivalry, but it also touches upon uh, the weaknesses that were mentioned about the international legal system and how it was ready or not uh, to deal with this phenomenon. So perhaps we could first um, address um, this first question of uh, how could the, 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 the World Health um, Organization be reformed and how, what would be the perspectives for that uh, from what uh, your point of view? And perhaps I start with Simon because the question was addressed to him, but uh, any of the other panelists are welcome to join also. Thanks, and, and thanks to Mohammed Rizwan al Islam for the question. Um, and I, don't, I have no really good short answer. Of course, in theory, if we were serious about dealing with pandemics and we regarded them as a threat on the scale of military conflict, then we could set up institutions equivalent to the UN Security Council with coercive powers. Uh, but we haven't done that. Uh, the World Health Organization is set up as broadly a consultative body, it can coordinate responses, uh, it has a certain, or arguably has a certain moral leadership and scientific expertise. It's one of very few international organizations actually where the head of the organization actually requires any kind of practical experience. The only other one is the um, Interpol, where one is expected to have a policing background, the WHO, the head of the WHO is meant to have a medical background. Um, but in terms of how that reform process might happen right now, Going back to what I said about the US withdrawing from the WHO, this is not the moment to engage in a root and branch reform of the World Health Organization. Right now, we should be concentrating, as most people are, on trying to get through the pandemic. But coming out of this, one point 
um, that I think is interesting raising the question is the status of international health regulations. Uh, and indeed, there's, uh, of all the talk about litigation around the pandemic, one of the most interesting, I think, would be the possibility a couple of years from now of an International Court of Justice advisory opinion on the status of the international health regulations, which would clarify the role of the WHO, at least as it's currently set up, in coordinating international responses to future pandemics. And I think that is something that's realistic and, and, and achievable in the next couple of years. But a complete reform of the WHO uh, would be very, very difficult at the moment, I think. Yes, please tell me. Um, I, I want to be very provocative. I want to say the Western countries are being totally hypocritical. Why do I say that? I say that because over a period of years, the Western countries have progressively reduced funding of WHO. It's ridiculous that today, less than half of the WTO, WHO's budget is funded by compulsory contribution by member states. And WHO has to depend on voluntary contribution. When you depend on voluntary contribution, you're beholden to the donor. The donor dictates your agenda. It's terrible. You know? And what, who's responsible for this state of affairs? It is the Western countries. The Western countries have deliberately, over a period of time, marginalized WHO and made it weak. And now they are saying that, why is WHO so weak? I say, WHO is weak because the Western country conspired to make it weak. I also want to reply to a comment by Simon about the suitability of Dr. Tedros to be the head. Simon seemed to be saying that he's not qualified to be the head because he's not a, not a doctor. No, not at all. I didn't say anything of the sort. But, he has, he but, has a medical background. He's, he, I've got nothing against him. I think he's been a perfectly good head of the WHO. I, I said nothing against him. No, but you said something about the heads of the UN agencies and, and the qualification to serve. Didn't you do that? I said that there are two uh, across. This comes back to a, a, a study I did of executive heads of international organizations. And usually there's no job description, like the UN Secretary General, no job description. The WHO, you have to have a medical background, as Dr. Tedros does. And the only other one is Interpol, where you have to have a policing background. I, I intended no aspersion against Dr. Tedros. I think he's done a, a, as good a job as anyone could have in the circumstance. So I, I want to take the opportunity. I want to take the opportunity to um, defend Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros is being demonized by some Western power. This is totally unfair. And I want to say on behalf of the ASEAN country that the ASEAN countries hold him in great respect. And that in a virtual meeting of the ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus China, Japan, and uh, South Korea, we invited Dr. Tedros to join us at that meeting. And that is a token of ASEAN confidence and in him and respect. Right? Okay. Shall we go to the uh, second question, Patricia? Yes. Okay, I'm going to now, uh, you see, we're, we're, we're definitely a team, Patricia and I. <laughs> so we're going to go to the second question. And one thing that in our little chat box, we can tell how many people support the question. And this one has to do with that of lawfare, which uh, Tommy uh, had raised. And the question is from Marcus Song, with 10 others supporting, while lawfare seems to have negative connotations. If it prevents warfare, doesn't it mean that international law has, in a sense, been successful? So I open this. Um, Tommy, you can take uh, the first stab at it, but it's open to all panelists to answer. Wow. Um, I, I, I think my, Marcus is right. And I want to say something about, um, I want to uh, quote Churchill during the Cold War. Um, there were complaints that there were so many negotiations that don't result in agreement. 
And Churchill replied to the critics by saying, it is better to jaw jaw than to war war. In other words, better to talk than to fight. And I would say, I agree with Marcus, it's better to have law law than war war. It's better for us to have disputes about legal matters, but in a peaceful way than to resort to violence. Thank you, yes, may our, may our weapons be words. Uh, Daphne, did you want to say something? Um, I wanted to weigh into second debt, but as a government lawyer, um, I must say, though, that if there's an increase in lawfare, it does exert a lot of pressure um, on government legal departments. Um, but if, if, if the, 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 the price of debt is um, to prevent warfare, then by all means, let the lawfare come. Yeah, thanks to practical aspects. I guess the question is, when does it become an abuse of rights, so to speak? Um, all right. Uh, anyone Maybe else want to? Oh. Yeah, please. Just to throw in one more comment. I mean, there is there is the danger, though, that as law becomes instrumentalized like this, it comes to be seen as an instrument. Uh, when the history of international law really, in many ways, is the history of lawyers and others trying to make international law more than just one policy, one foreign policy justification among others. Uh, and so while I completely endorse the, I love the George Orr versus World War line also, um, there is a danger that if law comes to be seen as this instrument, then it's a bit like what happened in the UN Security Council through the 1990s. So through the 1990s, we had a period of great activism uh, and chapter seven, of the Security Council was argued, of the UN Charter was arguably stretched in interpretation uh, as the UN uh, Security Council authorized operations that might not have been authorized under a very narrow reading of the Charter. Uh, and the problem was that while many people agreed with those resolutions through the 1990s, what happened in 1999 was you had a similar situation in Kosovo uh, that had been addressed. Uh, in comparable contexts in previous circumstances where there was a, a willingness to adopt the UN Security Council resolution, uh, but then the fact that there was no Security Council resolution meant that the, uh, the, the intervention in Kosovo went ahead anyway. So not suggesting we need to get into a debate about the merits or demerits of Kosovo itself, uh, there is a danger that as you bend law to your foreign policy justifications, uh, it diminishes the value of law uh, in its own right. Uh, and so that, that's my own hesitation about lawfare. Well, I, I interpreted um, the question lawfare um, um, as resorting to mandatory third party dispute um, settlement mechanisms um, in order to resolve disputes instead of um, going for warfare. So um, I looked at it from that narrow sense. And um, if we look at it through that lens, then I, I'm, I think Singapore's position is well known. Um, we see if, if negotiation, if consultations, if political talks result in an impasse such that the, the overall bilateral relationship is um, in jeopardy, then um, mandatory third party dispute resolution mechanisms, placing disputes before a neutral third party is certainly um, a, a viable way to, to resolving uh, disputes. So, so, so I see it from that um, um, lens. Um, in fact, when it comes, but, but even looking at that lens, there's only one situation whereby um, I can well see that lawfare May, may result in um, a party cynically using the law for, for its own ends that um, I see as not, not being ideal. And, and that is um, in the, the situation of investor state um, disputes, where you have, where it is quite possible for very, very wealthy um, NMCs to take on the, 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 the government because they have um, tremendous resources at their disposal in order to stymie legitimate um, lawmaking. 
So, um, so outside that, that situation, um, when I read the, the, the question, uh, sometimes you, you know, people say lawfare has got uh, ne negative connotations, but I do see the upside of it. All right, I think uh, perhaps we can go to the next round of questions, Patricia. Yes, uh, I want to pick up of one of the questions in the chat that I think uh, is interesting and it touches on a point that caught my attention. Um, the question is by Udai Banu Singh and um, it's about Professor Jaya Kumar's remark that there may be a reverting to non-alignment. Um, and he, uh, he says that it's surprising because many appear to have sounded the death knell of non-alignment a while back and India's notion of strategic autonomy is still questioned by some. Um, it's been suggested, I've heard it in uh, recent discussions, that uh, you know, also this rivalry between the US and China could open this uh, uh, door for um, non-alignment movement, for coalitions, different coalitions of small countries around different uh, interests, regional groupings. Um, and, and so I think this question is quite interesting. I don't know if... Uh, Professor Jayakumar wants to um, explain a little bit better or others want to comment on this possibility of a new version of the non-alignment aligned movement. Well, I'm just looking ahead. If the dynamics between the China and United States really worsen, what would be the natural reactions of smaller and medium-sized countries, Asia, Africa, Latin America. Of course, the situation is not exactly the same as the Cold War between United States and Soviet Union. But I do see that the smaller countries would have a dilemma, a dilemma which individually they may find difficult to resist the pressurizing and cajoling by either of these big powers. So I think it's a natural reaction for them to seek some comfort with existing groupings or new groupings. Existing groupings are regional groupings. Uh, and of course, there is an existing non-aligned movement uh, at the United Nations. But from my experience, this NAM, NAM, which really had relevance in the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union, uh, has evolved into a political body. It's highly politicized in the UN. It is not relevant to the existing situation. And I don't think it can be used by smaller and medium-sized countries in the new quote-unquote Cold War because China is an observer in the existing NAM grouping. The United States is not an observer. So I, do, I don't see the existing NAM structure as being uh, suitable. But something like that might be uh, evolve if situation gets worse. And that is a broad uh, crystal ball gazing that I wanted to float. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need really to think out of the box and, and try to predict a bit the future. I don't know if um, anybody else would like to um, intervene on this. Yes, Lionel, go ahead. Yeah, thank, you, thank, thank you, Patricia. Um, just want to add that um, whatever that alignment may be, may, may not necessarily be a, 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 a sort of multilateral sort of global one. Even as of today, um, there has over the years been, I would say, a much greater level of uh, regional uh, consciousness, uh, um, regional integration in, across many parts of the world. 
the African Union, for example, uh, is integrated and, 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 and coordinates on, on, on matters of foreign policy to an extent that um, we would not have seen, uh, say, 20 or, or, or 30 years ago. And I think there's a sense really that, um, as, uh, that there is some safety in numbers and I, 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 and it is, I think that sort of dynamic is uh, uh, likely to grow if, uh, as, as, as uh, states uh, find themselves needing uh, that, that, that safety in numbers uh, more and more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we are about uh, to reach our limit, uh, so maybe perhaps, um, although there are some very interesting questions still to be answered, um, I think it's now time for a few concluding remarks and uh, I'll just make a couple of uh, remarks and then um, uh, pass the floor on to uh, Nilofer to close the event. Um, I think we can say, I mean, trying on the spot to uh, summarize all that has been said, it's almost impossible. But for me, the uh, main ideas um, of this discussion, which I think were an excellent uh, uh, launch to our e-academy and to make us think about uh, the future of international law and in particular um, in Asia, um, it's that, um, of course, crises are always um, a, a moment of opportunity. They bring many negative aspects, but they also bring positive aspects. And what we saw as st stress tests and identification of gaps um, were, uh, in a way, accelerated by the current pandemic crisis. And so there is a common feeling that there's a need to advance international law, to advance its institutions, Although the current political uh, moment of uh, rivalry between big powers and uh, a certain lack of political leadership um, was pointed out. Um, a few areas that were identified as areas for improvement and advancing international law were, for example, trade, human rights, especially integrating economic, social and cultural rights and civil and political rights, the questions of climate change and all the area of technology and, um, and cybersecurity, for example. And a point that was also eloquently made was uh, how that technology can also be used to advance um, diplomacy and e-diplomacy of the future uh, to help international lawmaking. And I think that's a very important point. Um, so we'll see what the future will bring us in terms of uh, uh, coalitions, non-aligned movements, and a way to, uh, despite of the current political situation, uh, make international law advance, uh, make it better and make it more efficient um, and, and suitable and capable to address uh, challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemics and climate change, was, which was also greatly highlighted. So I think these are main um, points that we can take out from the discussion today. And, and I will pass the floor to Nilofer for the last remarks. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Patricia. I think you summed up very nicely. And I have to thank uh, our participants who joined us, but also our panelists on this roundtable, which I think we had a rich discussion, but we really just scratched the surface of these uh, questions. Uh, and each one of these is our, our very, um, so they're very um, deep questions, really, and we and we can start with the first one, the pandemic. Uh, it has altered uh, many things, and I and I appreciate Lionel's comments on pointing out to the technological uh, changes it will bring. Our use of so our use of uh, internet and digital means, but what that means for international lawmaking, we will see. Uh, I think that this is uh, one of the big challenges because we don't know when we'll be in the post-COVID situation. Uh, so it's very important. And again, technology, um, Daphne very ably brought up in her response to the question of climate change, but I think also highlighting the need for us to be interdisciplinary, innovative, that law should not be narrow. And, and that through climate change and the use of technology, perhaps we have opportunities um, to expand um, the role of law in this way. 
But then coming to the question of um, the rivalry, we talked about lawfare, and I think we had a very dis interesting discussion on that, on, on the positive, you know, jaw jaw versus war war, but also it can lead to the lack of credibility of law as well, and we have to be very careful about that. And then I think the last, there were many questions that we were not able to get to on, on small states, and Singapore has a rich and very important experience. Um, and there was one question, yeah, perhaps it's not just size at all uh, in terms of strength. Um, so maybe we'll follow up on this, but I think I thank you all for setting a fantastic um, launch to our program for promoting international law. Bottom line, we are all practitioners. We believe in international law, the rule of law. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that we have the next generation well-versed in understanding international law. And I think that is the center, not just for the region, but, but internationally, globally, that's a mission. And I'm, ho and I'm very, very hopeful that this academy uh, will be a continuation of the work that the center has done. So if I could just have a round of uh, <laughs> virtual applause <laughs> to all of you and thank all the participants for joining us. Uh, it's truly valuable, and I am sorry if we weren't able to get to, to all your questions. But next time. Goodbye to all. <laughs>